Well, hi everybody, Julie here. I am, you know, I'm I'm a person who is uh, blessed beyond belief because I get to talk to very interesting people all day. I get to talk to scientists and lawyers and uh, physicians. And although I have to say, physicians not quite as often as I would like because it's a fairly closed group these days. And it isn't very often when you find a physician who is willing or able to comment on what's been going on over the last couple of years in any way that departs from sort of the party line. Um, so anytime someone is, is willing to have a more thoroughgoing, investigative, authentic conversation about where we're at, where we've come from, especially grateful for that. So I would like to introduce um, Dr. Crystal Butchkill. Have I said that right, even remotely? Close, yes, Butchkill. Yes. So can you, can you just um, tell us a little bit about who you are and then we will, um, and then maybe Michael, you can jump in. Maybe you can introduce Michael and then Michael can jump in and explain why he's here. Sure. So first of all, thank you, Julie, for um, having us and inviting us to be here to share. Uh, some thoughts and ideas and experiences that we've had over the last two years. My name is Dr. Crystal Lechkew. I'm a family physician and I am also a palliative care physician. Um, so I've practiced independently for eight years in Barrie, Ontario, various roles until I settled into um, a family practice that I took over in October of 2019. And I continued on doing my palliative care work because it's really uh, gratifying and um, very important work to be done and not a lot not a lot of people doing it so um, and kind of how I got to um, taking over this practice was I'd worked in a hospital for many years and I had a family and that kind of work was getting really cumbersome um, and there's a lot of politics in hospital um, that I was seeing and I was not enjoying. So I kind of was backing away from that over the last four years. Um, and I'm quite happy in my family practice. I have 1,600 patients and I'm in, my, my office is in a retirement home. And so I have a lot of elderly patients. <clears throat> and um, it's, a, it's like an independent living community. It's really lovely. Mm -hmm. um, and as the pandemic hit and... It, you know, these dramatic changes in life happened um, and the way that we know life to be. I started seeing a lot of changes in my patients very early on, especially my elderly patients, um, a lot related to the isolation and um, very rapid deterioration of health and weight loss and memory. Um, and it was really starting to affect me as well. Um, and I really could see these consequences happening. So I started to kind of be very investigative myself and um, trying to get to the bottom of as many issues and risks and consequences and looking at things very broadly. Um, and unfortunately, it was not really highly accepted any longer, that kind of thinking. And Are ended up questions. <laughs> being yes, that's kind of looking for yes, evidence. And, <laughs> yes, and, and looking at the other side of, you know, not just not just looking at the benefits of of a lockdown or whatever response measure um, is being put out there, but there's always consequences. And you know, how do those weigh with the benefits and who's being harmed or who's benefiting? Those kinds of questions. Mm -hmm. Um, and I started noticing things I could do for my patients to help them along the way, like talking about weight loss for, because obesity is such a big risk factor for COVID and then vitamin D, things like that. So I was checking my patients' vitamin D levels and I was, you know, giving them advice on how they can improve their immune systems and their health overall. Um, and that kind of led me down a path. I had a more balanced approach, led me down a path of complaints. Um, for my office infectious disease protocol. And um, then subsequently, there was a complaint that went from my hospital. I left there in not such great circumstances, but um, they complained from the upper echelons of my community hospital 
to the upper echelons of college with physicians and surgeons. And it really uh, spiraled very quickly into a highly disrespectful and abusive process. Um, and so that's what how I- complaints? I'll just pause just so that we can understand what kind of complaints were being lodged against you. So initially the complaint was about um, one of the, one of my staff member ha has a mask exemption. And so when patients would come in, they, some of them were highly fearful and, um, you know, their expectations were um, perhaps not aligned and didn't like that. So there was initially a complaint to public health, public health called to the college. I dealt with the college over the phone and they said, sounds like you're doing everything fine. That wasn't good enough for this person. So then it went on to actually Ministry of Labor complaint and they came in and investigated I, you know, tickety-boo, everything's fine. Um, no recommendations to change anything I'm doing. And then that went to a formal complaint to the college from this citizen, this person. Um, I dealt with that, was fully cleared of that through the college. And at the same time, uh, I was leaving the hospital because of um, some really egregious um, and unethical Actions I was seeing. Um, I was coerced aggressively to change a death certificate on a patient of mine. Um, and the way that palliative care and end of life patients were being treated was cruel, in my opinion. I, um, we have to pause there for a minute. <laughs> All right. If I, yeah. Well, so there's, there's a lot about ethics and work mm -hmm. in the medical ethics context a little bit. This is alarming. <laughs> yes. It, and it was um, me. Can you tell, I uh, share what you feel you can, or, um, but why, what were you asked to do in, in changing a death certificate and, and why was that being asked of you? And it so it's like something that should never happen. No. And, you know, as a, a physician in the hospital where if patients are under my care, I'm, I'm considered the most responsible physician mm -hmm. for the MRP. And so I was um, the MRP for this patient who is actively dying. And she passed away um, in the morning. And I was called to fill out the death certificate, which I did. And then about five hours later, I was contacted by a nurse saying that she tested, this patient tested positive for COVID. I had to come back and change the death certificate. And so I said, no, I don't. Um, she passed away of natural causes, and I won't say what those were, but I was highly confident. I knew all of the details of her chart. I mean, to the best of my ability at that time. I knew she'd been tested two days prior as well, and it was negative. And she was actively dying. She was hours from the end of her life, and she passed before that was resulted. There was no, you know, there's another ethical issue there, and violating someone's body with no permission um, while they're dying. There's no dignity there. So anyhow, um, I said, no, you know, I'm, I'm confident that this is what it is. That didn't contribute whatsoever to her death. And then it didn't, it just didn't end there. It went on. So the another fire was for you to say that the cause of death was COVID, not that she died having tested positive for COVID. Yeah, to change the death certificate as if COVID should have been added, um, but she didn't have COVID. Um, you know, there's there's so many issues that we could go into and branch into there about, you know, reliability of testing and things like that. But regardless, her body was almost expired anyway by that time. Why would you test her? No one was in that room. Her family wasn't allowed to come in. Nobody had been exposed. It was just really unreasonable and absurd. So why this pressure, do you think? Where did it well, come from? It, it was very, very big pressure. So it went up. I had four phone calls to change this death certificate. And then um, they actually called my resident. So a resident is a junior doctor, not an independent physician. So needs my permission or, you know, my approval because my name's on it. And they went so far as to actually call him and see if he would change it. Um, and of course he didn't. And we talked about that. And I went in the next day to try to see 
um, what was going on there. And it was really just, uh, you know, we're getting a lot of pressure. Um, everyone's feeling a lot of pressure. And I said, you know, pressure from who for what? And this really needs to be escalated. And of course it didn't. And then I'm, I'm the one that's being attacked for speaking out about these kinds of actions happening at our hospital. Um, is it your perception, or I'm not sure if you know, or, or is it your, your perception that this pressure was came from within the hospital itself or from public health or some other external? I think um, it's kind of, it to, to me, it's a combination of everything, right? The culture became um, so mm. insidiously involved and, and um, emotionally driven with only COVID as kind of our main focus. And, um, mm -hmm. you know, there's so myopic. many problems. Yeah, very myopic and so many problems with that. But it's affected now the way that um, people are behaving and treating other human beings. And, um, and, and that's kind of where I have, I draw my line. Um, I'm very, I'm very curious about how this happened, you know, and thinking more broadly about the culture of medicine and shifts. And uh, it seems to me that there's, you know, if we look at a decades long period of time, a shift away, probably starting with or being punctuated at least by, um, you know, the Nuremberg trials and realizing that authoritarianism and, and paternalism in medicine and, and various things along the spectrum between those two things are quite harmful. And so we build up this large sort of canon of, of research and policy, uh, trying to understand and um, build up and, and, in, and support informed consent. And now it seems like we've, we're backtracking on that. And, and very um, quickly, and uh, it's almost like we've pulled the rug out from underneath us. Um, <clears throat> and when I was trained, I mean, our training was very clear in um, medical ethics. We're essentially the supreme law of, of the land in medicine. And, you know, I took that very seriously. And, and I, I really kind of thought deeply about what the goals of treating a human being in medicine are. And from my perspective, it's with compassion and, and with dignity and, mm -hmm. and with ethics. Um, you know, we've learned what our, our roles are, and it's not to control somebody else's decision of what they do with their body. Um, and yes, people will try to argue that um, public health safety or you know, a virus or this or that. Um, but there hasn't ever been any significant demonstrable evidence um, that would sway me to say, okay, then this is a an exception. Um, and so that I, the threat in this case should override autonomy. And, yeah. Because mm -hmm. really how many of those should exist? Not many from my perspective. Um, because of the harms, right? The harms of of removing patient's autonomy, which is essentially human agency. If if we remove that, um, there's a lot of harm and suffering that happens. And so there needs to be a risk benefit analysis that's done that kind of you know looks at the qualitative nature as well as the quantitative. But we've kind of elevated science and, and quantitative. Um, measures to be the be all and end all. Yeah, that when you talk about risk benefit balancing and evaluation, I mean that is the stuff of public health, right? That is that is how it works. But it seems like what we've um, uh, all our eggs are in the quantitative, uh, you know, PCR test case number ICU coat dying with COVID basket. And we've forgotten about all these other kinds of harms. And you mentioned, I think, quite eloquently that we, I mean, it, if there are ever justifications for imposing rules mm -hmm. that result in forcing people to do something with their body, um, the standard has to be very high, very rigorous, very clear evidence to show that not doing that would cause harm. And then right. um, and to fill out that moral language a little bit and to put it in very kind of simple terms is just to say that the human beings should 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 be and should want to be the authors of their own lives. And if we're not going to allow that, we need to have very good reason for that, right? Absolutely. 
um, we've gotten into, you know, this kind of process of uh, teaching uh, people, human beings, to fear one another and this sense of learned helplessness in all of this. And, and it's very devastating and very damaging. Um, and there's a lot of bullying um, and, and cruel behaviors that are resulting from it. Um, and I, you know, I'm actively aware and do my very best to always weigh what people's concerns are and, and balance them. And I'm super respectful. Uh, you know, if somebody's very fearful, I'll do my best and I'll, I'll wear my PPE and stay away and whatever to help them get the care they need. But other people's care needs aren't being met from the other side. So somebody at end of life who can't have their family or loved one there, right. um, you know, it, that is so atrocious and cruel to me that there has to be a way. Why haven't we looked at another way? Why haven't we, you know, tried? Um, I think we haven't. I, I, I think you said at one point that COVID took over as the only threat to human life and sidelined all others as though we care about nothing else. Why do you think that happened? And why do you think we haven't worked to try to minimize the harms that these restrictions are, are causing? As you say, I mean, when someone dies without their loved ones there, we can't fix that a year from now or five years yeah. from now. That can never, and it's as horrible as it is for the person who has died, the people, the, the children or the spouse who are left behind without that opportunity for closure and not knowing what kind of suffering their loved one goes through in the hospital and they're not there. And I've personally been involved in a number of cases trying to advocate for people who aren't allowed to have access to their loved ones because of their vaccination status and aren't able to advocate on their behalf, knowing what their, their beliefs and their preferences are. Um, so I, it's a very complex web. Um, that I'm sure started a long time ago in sort of certain shifts and um, policies. and But what I think it comes down to a lot in the moment where we're now is people's attention and awareness are their own to discover and, and decide where they're going to place that. And if you're only placing your awareness and attention on COVID as the virus and the pandemic and the fear and the risk, you're going to remain in that emotional, um, you know, spinning kind of wheel that just keeps perpetually going. And it keeps going because of the constant messaging, um, the constant messaging from government, from public health, from other doctors, from the, you know, perceived experts um, and from from each other now, citizens uh, towards one another, it's very emotionally driven. And so when you are kind of stuck in this emotional thought process, you can't get very deep and you can't think broadly um, and you you really can't explore where the where the problems arise from or where they go to. Um, and you certainly don't ask a lot of questions because you just kind of need to be told and guided because of that fear. And there's a sense of requiring comfort um, in, in this time. And it's misguided as far as I'm concerned. I'm curious about what you're seeing in your practice and also among uh, colleagues, and not just physicians, but, but uh, um, nurses and other kinds of healthcare professionals in terms of um, you know, where are they at mentally? Are they all as on board with the COVID narrative as they were? Are they starting to shift? How much fear and um, sort of moral exhaustion has settled in? I mean, what kinds of things are you noticing in the medical community? Well, that's a tough question because um, for quite a long time, I've been pushed out of my medical community. Right. So, um, you know, based on my choices and, you know, I, I'll own those choices, but it's another fact of whether those consequences are actual natural consequences or if they're punishments, right? And so there's there's been this active process of um, not answering my questions and um, then 
making assumptions that I, you know, have certain views and then labeling and, and then kind of pushing me out of, of every other area of medicine in, in our, in our community, really. Mm-hmm. And there's no engagement in discussion. So I, it's hard for me to have a true sense of where people are, but, no. but there's definitely, mm-hmm. yeah, there's definitely been a, a mix, a small, a smaller minority. Um, there was a number of healthcare workers and myself that were trying to actively um, get our hospital to engage. And, and that certainly didn't happen. It was a top down, very aggressive um, approach that I've never seen happen before. What is the top of that top down as far as you can tell? So the top of it looks like it's, you know, the CEO and the vice president. Um, but it it's actually also the the board, uh, the board of directors that's in the background. Um, it's the the government and public health and the funding. I mean, it it's a it's a big interconnected system, um, and it's also uh, the college, as I've learned <laughs> quite quickly. Mm-hmm. Um, so the the structure of it, you know, they have these values that talk about commitment and communication and the right patient and the right floor um, and the right, you know, this and that for the best care. Mm -hmm. Um, And to be honest, what I was seeing was very superficial. Those are good things to say, but they're not happening in in action. Um, And some people struggled with that. There was a lot of nurses on, especially the palliative care ward, that over time, the the exhaustion, the moral exhaustion was really, you could see it, it was wearing on them, physically could see it. Mm-hmm. Um, people weren't engaging similarly the way that they used to anymore. Um, there's a hardenedness almost to right. to a lot of people. Um, and there's certainly there's been no, not a lot of physicians at all in my community that have reached out to me through everything that I'm going through. Um, and, and none of them that have reached out to me to say, you know, hey, uh, I really share a lot of similar thoughts and sentiments. Could we chat? Um, so it's a little bit disconcerting, but um, it is it is where, what it is now. So so many, so many questions. I, I, I want to make sure before we leave that I get to ask you about um whether or not the fact is matching the story that we get from the media. And one part of that story, one chapter, I think, is and, and, and from our public health officials, is that the state of hospitals is like this state of hysteria where the, the demand is, you know, far overstretching the capacity to meet the demand, that there are COVID patients suffering terribly in hallways without enough respirators, and that it's all going to collapse very, very soon. Um, I'd like to have a sense of whether you saw that sort of story playing out in your area. Mm -hmm. Um, So by it, and and this is, I think, where part of my troubles started was because I was honest in talking about my experiences. So very clearly, these are my professional lived experiences. Mm -hmm. The hospital um, especially at the very beginning when, when the first lockdown happened, that was a state of fear, which was paralyzing for people and paralyzing that they didn't go to the hospital and they did not seek the ER. It was a ghost town. It was very eerie. It was literally, it felt almost like a twilight zone, never seen anything like it before. And of course we were expecting the opposite, um, And I can't really make a lot of comments on the state of, you know, the emergency room with with uh, patients in respiratory distress from COVID or the ICU or anything like that. But I can talk about the wards and I actually have um, very clear data from a Freedom of Information Act request from a person I've been working with through um, different hospitals in Ontario. And um, it, it quite clearly outlines that there's no hospital that has been um, over capacity. And um, yeah, and so the story that we're hearing from the media 
And I, I'm sure there's so many other variables and factors that have contributed to the decisions to like, you know, to transfer patients from Toronto to Barrie or other hospitals, things like that. Um, but by and large, none of the hospitals that we have um, gotten the data back from, um, and, and the dates go back from 2017 all the way to, uh, I think, maybe January of 2022. Um, and it's it's very clear. Um, they've never been at full capacity, and normally we are actually above capacity throughout flu season. Um, I haven't What's seen much hallway medicine at all. Yeah, those dates you mentioned allow a comparison between COVID and a couple of years prior to that. Yeah, so previous flu seasons, right? Those are always a really challenging time in our hospitals and really um, eat away at resources. And um, and and there's always hospital, um, you know, makeshift rooms and um, mm-hmm. privacy is always an issue. We've always had to deal with that. Um, and really, when you look at everything and you know, people like myself or others who are willing to speak out, um, it's not, it has not been what they're claiming at all. That's really, I mean, it's sometimes it's easy to, to, to let these things just go by, but this is, this is a remarkable claim that, it is. right. That no hospital yeah. as, as far as you can tell. None of the ones, yeah. None of the ones that we have data from. In Ontario. Right? Yeah. And I can certainly send that information to you. Um, It's very important for the public to know that because this is part of the narrative that fuels the pressure of people to do what the government says to create this crisis situation in which we're fearful that we're we're at our our capacity, that we're we're, something terrible is just around the corner. If we don't act quickly, what is acting quickly? We've got to lock down, we've got to vaccinate, we've got to wear all these masks. And as we were saying before, to the exclusion of uh, a sense of awareness of the harms that those those things are doing as well. Right, and and all of the the messaging and and the information and emails we were getting from our hospital administration um, was very biased, and you know that's a challenge as a physician because my entire training is you know, make sure you know your bias, make sure you park it at the door as best you can, that kind of thing. And, um, you know, there was, there's no questions, there's no discussion of the other side, you know, the mental health crisis that we're seeing, the addiction and overdose um, Mm -hmm. kind of epidemic. It's even worse than it used to be. Um, And it's being not discussed, it's being negated, dismissed, almost covered up and hidden. Um, they don't ever put that kind of information in the emails and the messaging and, you know, oh, I know the benefits are, are this or that, but we're starting to see these harms, um, you know, patients that are not getting and seeking care in time and having delayed, um, investigations or delayed diagnoses and treatment, um, we're seeing things we've never seen before, but nobody's willing to talk about it. If you're not talking about it, how are we ever going to get to the bottom and solve it? Um, It's just going to keep getting worse. It's interesting to me, you know, talking about, it seems like people are quite willing to talk about certain things, but not other things. And uh, my understanding from your story is that you had a bit of a whistleblowing phenomenon with someone claiming that you were at a rally that was considered to be anti-mask or something. uh, And that this is someone that you worked with. And, um, is this new in medicine, do you think? Is this um, professional behavior? Is this, I mean, it's done in the service of protecting people. Presumably that's part of the narrative, right. I suppose. But yeah. and that's, that's kind of the guise. Um, and, and that's, you know, I was contacted by my chief of staff um, who immediately knew that he had no right to ask me what I was doing uh, personally. Um, you know, even though I was seen at one of these rallies um, in my community. And he, you know, he continued to go on asking me all these questions. And so I asked him, why did this person who had an issue with me not come and speak to me about it first? And why are you not asking that person to come and speak to me? Because that's the normal kind of conflict management that we would see 
And he said, oh, yeah, that's a great question. And just kept going on. And it happened multiple times from the same person. And it's 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 almost like there's an excuse that they can have this excuse for this um, abusive behavior. You know, I can't help but think of, um, I mean, I, you, you, you let me know if you think I'm unreasonably making an analogy, but I can't help but think of the kind of calling out and tattletaling and whistleblowing that would go on in things like Nazi regimes, right? And that you were somehow made better to the degree that you could uh, identify the outlier or the nonconformist. And do you see that happening? Mean, this is a, seems to be an example of that, a punctuated example. Is it anomalous? Are you seeing that? Have you heard other, um, I mean, no, that's sort of anecdotal, but um, is this a phenomenon that's becoming like part of the COVID virtue signaling? It makes you a good person to the degree that you can sort of tattle on someone else for di diverging from the narrative. Yeah, and I've, I've certainly heard a lot of conversations and, you know, walking through the wards in the hospitals and, um, you know, I've, I've even in my own life, I have friends who, you know, proudly tout that they yelled at an elderly person in a store for not wearing a mask and, and without any kind of reflection on what is that behavior and how is that statement harmful to that person or how is that treatment harmful to that person? And it just goes on and on and it gets worse and worse. In some cases, it's it's obviously not proportion or not totally proportional in every case. Um, but it's certainly happening and it's been escalating to grander scales um, to the point that I I have actually had my medical license suspended. Um Currently. And, yeah, six weeks ago. And so um, you know, the tattletaling is is kind of, you know, I had a patient who went into the hospital who was unvaccinated. And it's all based on assumptions that his um, his exemption was uh, from me because they know my my views. and and it's there's no evidence. It's all based on assumption. It's tattletaling to the regulatory body who can then do something about. Uh, you know, a physician like me that's so dangerous. It's it's really, um, it's a process that really needs to stop. And so that's why I'm speaking out because there are a lot of really great physicians and nurses and healthcare workers. And if we remove all of us from that system, it is not headed anywhere good because of the leadership and the behavior that's happening at the leadership level and the actions that are being taken towards other people. And certainly the treatment of, of patients that I've, I've seen, and I'm not saying that's in every case, but I'm saying I've seen egregious treatment of human beings in a healthcare setting that I've never seen before. You mean people um, treated badly for their vaccination choices or just generally unmasking and things like that? Yeah, so um, all of it. So vaccination choices, any patients that I've had to um, that have been hospitalized have been treated poorly by many people in the hospital, including the physicians. Um, and I think that is do the can you elaborate on like where is that coming from? Do you think? Are they frustrated because they want the pandemic to be over and they see these people as preventing it? Are they um, is it just like you know when when school kids get frustrated at the kids that don't follow the rules? Where where is it coming from? It it seems to you know how we kind of talked about that shift and in, in regression back towards the authoritarian and paternalistic model. Um, I think we've shifted pretty far, and in, in that paternalistic model now, there's this this sense that. Um, you know, the vaccination is the elixir. It's the it's the only thing um, and everyone has to do it or we're stuck. But that is absolutely not true. And there's never one solution for any given problem. And so it, it's it's this perpetual kind of, I don't know, it's like people are stuck in the same belief system. That isn't that, working, that will never work. It isn't working. And if you if you look at the way things were, in 2020 to 2021 to 2022, they're getting worse and worse 
and worse. And so when we look at the measures that have been put in place for the greater good, and we could talk forever about what that means too, um, I'd argue that it's not doing anybody any good. So what, at what point do we pause? At what point do we reflect on the actions that we've taken so far? Has anybody ever come out and said, hey, something isn't working? No. Um, and, and that's that's hubris, right? That's an interesting question, cool. right? I mean, do, do healthcare professionals think that our pandemic response is successful? I, I don't know that they've looked at it, right? I, I, I'm not sure. <laughs> it's hard to, to engage um, people kind of shut down um, when, when you start to ask questions that challenge their worldview. And, um, and I, I certainly don't have that opportunity very often in a non-threatening kind of sense or way. Mm-hmm. Um, and so that's kind of how I'm trying to get this, um, exploration idea out there and this pause idea. And we really do, uh, you know, we are approaching a, a point of no return, I fear, um, our healthcare system was already busting at the seams. You know, my suspension in my community has caused such chaos amongst pharmacies, amongst my colleagues, amongst my patients. And obviously I have a uh, quite an ex- existential crisis dealing with not being able to care for my patients at this time. But it was not something anybody expected. But was prepared or could handle in terms of the systemic structure that exists. We were getting phone calls at our office because we were sending patients to the walk-in clinic that we're associated with as a family health team. And we were getting calls saying our patients could not go there. We had to tell them to stop calling. And I'm not telling my patients to stop calling somewhere that they have access to as a community member. And why is um, that? Because they're your former patients? Or- well, because they're... Um, it's it's just they don't have the capacity to deal with this extra overflow of 1,600 patients. Mm-hmm. Um, and that's that gets into kind of the, the legal aspects of things that Michael, I hope, can explain because there's such, such great details of what we're doing, and it's so different than anything that's ever been done before. Um, and we were just talking about that last night. Michael, do you want to jump into the conversation and I'll let you comment on on what you uh, pick up on what Crystal has said that seems quite uh, relevant to you from a legal point of view? Mm-hmm. Well, uh, just <clears throat> thanks, Julie. One, one of the things about <clears throat> why the system is behaving as it does, <clears throat> I think there are a few factors here. One is that um, emergency planning in Canada and the US <clears throat> around something like a virus, uh, preparation for a public health emergency, has been based on a command and control model. And, mm-hmm. and so <clears throat> there are, in, in the way all of these, when, when they've had uh, you know, uh, tr- trial runs for how they will deal with uh, public health emergency, there's no room in this uh, system that they've developed for second thoughts. Um, the, 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 there's there's the, the, uh, uh, thought, critical thinking is not built into the system, <laughs> right? right? And 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 so what you have is a top down model coming mm-hmm. right from the WHO to member states to public health to the colleges to the hospitals. Boom, 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 boom. It's all been set up beforehand, mm-hmm. and uh, so it, it is actually an authoritarian model for public health. We just haven't been aware of how this has been developing. And then you have people in the system who have divided loyalties because big pharma has made such inroads into medicine and is responsible now for uh, the incomes of, of so many different people at all levels of medicine. That now and in academia as well. And academia in particular, that there's a tremendous resistance to um, big pharma's message, which obviously here is take the vaccine so we can make a trillion dollars. And everything else we'll ever come up with that we tell you you need. Yes, right. <laughs> and um, yeah, because obviously the price of speaking out is that you're not going to get that next research contract. Mm-hmm. And then I think in professional education, I say this as a professional, I think there's been a lack of uh, training in the universities uh, in critical thinking. 
Um, and uh, uh, it seems to me the, the, the doctors and many of the lawyers I speak to are actually not aware of the basic legal, legal principles that we should be um, paying attention to in the course of a public, public health emergency. So there's just, on some level, there's a lack of awareness of first principles in all of this. And I certainly um, heed your point about a lack of critical thinking. And as someone who taught that in various courses in various ways, it's, uh, there's a, 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 <laughs> a deafening lack, not only of it, but a deafening lack of interest. And, and what that tells me is that there's a much broader cultural problem here, right? Yes. It's, not, it's not just that students come to university perfectly ready to take on the education but there something in society at some point took hold of us as a group to tell us this is not important or this is not our responsibility or even it's a threat to what's really mm -hmm. important which well, is well and I, I think it's, it's the victory of technocratic education um you know over and against and this is where crystal stands out she has a background in humanities and she well, brings a, a, a <laughs> uh, she has an English degree. Uh, she did not study science before she went into medicine. Mm -hmm. And she brings those sensibilities um, of uh, looking at moral and uh, philosophic issues in the context of medicine in a way that unfortunately many others uh, do not and cannot. Uh, but the, the most important thing here to go back to an earlier part of the conversation is informed consent. Mm -hmm. And informed consent is, is fundamental to the liberal democratic view of the individual as, as a free person who has the right to make his or her own decisions. I mean, it's fundamentally grounded in our tradition. And the Supreme Court in both Canada and the United States has recognized this. Uh, in uh, 2015 case, Cartier here in Canada, there was an affirmation of the right of every person to make his or her medical decisions based on the principle of informed consent which means that you must have uh, uh, a discussion with your doctor in which the doctor informs you of the risks and benefits of treatment, possible adverse events, uh, alternatives to treatment. Um, uh, uh, the doctor also must check to make sure that you're not being coerced directly or indirectly into taking this treatment. Um, and, and so oh, these are all aspects of our fundamental law that people have just, they're just not paying attention to it. Uh, public, public, yeah. People, not just people in the public, but I'm very curious about what's going on in the courts. That case you mentioned is seven years old now. Has there been a shift away from focusing on informed consent? I followed a little bit what's going on in uh, the family court in these cases over, you know, parental disagreements about vaccination. And, and it's, you know, it, it's tricky. I'm wondering more generally, is informed consent playing a very big role in uh, judgments these days? Well, you know, it's just not being argued. Mm -hmm. There are just a handful of lawyers across the country, um, and I'm one of them, uh, who is arguing from the standpoint of first principles and saying, look, we, we, we uh, I, I mean, because the problem here is that at all levels, government, administrative bodies, particularly the colleges, have used COVID as an excuse to reach out beyond the jurisdiction of their actual authority. So what we have is something that in law school they call bureaucratic tyranny. But we have bureaucrats everywhere um, uh, taking more power upon themselves than the law allows. Mm -hmm. And this has been going for quite some time. This is a symptom of you know, the, the administrative state of all of these different bodies we have regulating our, um, our behavior and not enough political resources to police them. And, and so we're, we're, we're facing a situation here where uh, lawyers need to come in and assert fundamental rights over and against uh, government authority and bureaucratic authority. And uh, so informed consent, I think, is still recognized by the court, but they're just, as far as I know here in Ontario so far, like maybe four or five lawyers who are arguing that before the courts. So we won't see how the courts in Ontario are going to deal with this until we get into the next phase of, of, the, um, of these cases that are coming forward, and crystals will be coming forward soon. Mm -hmm. Well, that's very, it's very disturbing, but it's very interesting because I, because the, the philosopher in me wants to ask, well, how did this happen? You know, how do we get to the point where lawyers aren't in a, in a medical 
any kind of medical legal case, why are they not looking at informed consent initially? I mean, any discussion I've had with someone on the other side, and if I try to focus on autonomy and informed consent, it just gets sweeped under the rug of public safety. And that right. seems to me, I mean, Crystal, you were talking about how we're just at this sort of standstill where we, we aren't able to, to push through it. Um, how do you think we legally, medically, and from my background in academia, how do we um, push through that sort of irreconcilable tension, right, between autonomy, because it, and, and, and critical thinking that we've been talking about, that's an autonomous individual activity, right? So the degree to uh -huh. which we focus on the group and not the individual, of course, we're not going to care about critical thinking much anymore, right? Well, I think we've got a general cultural problem in Canada, and I, I wrote about this in my last book, um, which is that, I mean, in, in Canada, uh, people tend to think the su success of the group depends on the success of the individual. And in Canada, we tend to think that the success of the individual depends on the success of the group. Um, and having lived and studied on both sides of the border, uh, I, I have a little bit of insight into this. Hmm. Um, so I, I think there's a bias in favor of the collective in Canada. I don't think that's one of our better tendencies. Unfortunately, the courts, I can say about some decisions so far, some judges are just accepting the public narrative presented by public health and governments mm -hmm. about COVID-19 as a judicial fact, which is to say they're accepting the, the government story uh, uncritically and essentially saying we, we, we don't need to uh, question these basic facts. They are so evident to everybody. And that's where part of the problem begins in battling COVID right there. You have to get in front of a judge or a panel of judges who are willing to say, yes, we can question the pandemic narrative. Mm -hmm. uh, and or so, more fundamentally than that, yes, we must look at evidence and not just rely on assumptions and act as though something is a foregone conclusion when evidence has yes. gotten us there, right? That's right. And, and so what's very damaging right now to the other side is that we have had a couple of Canadians actually who've done more than a couple, who've done some very groundbreaking work with the Pfizer and Moderna clinical studies. And so those studies of sort of six month trials that were supposed to justify the use of the vaccines, uh, you know, that, that uh, those studies have been published and now there's supplemental information that has been published. You know, which radically qualifies what the original studies had to say, right? Mm -hmm. And so uh, now you can show that Pfizer's uh, clinical study, Moderna's clinical study, that they do not support the basic thesis, with, which is the vaccines do more uh, good than harm. Actually, we take a close look at the data. It's obvious they knew from the very beginning the vaccines would do more harm than good. And this can be proved scientifically. So you can you can blow this whole thing apart from within. You don't need 50 experts on this side and 50 experts on that side. Look at what Big Pharma said and the evidence they put forward to governments. And it is internally contradictory. And uh, so there was never a firm foundation on science for proceeding with any of this. Mm -hmm. This is so, oh, sorry, Crystal, go ahead. I was just gonna add to that. Um, I, I recently learned that the um, Security Exchange Council or SEC, is um, someone who requires Pfizer to, or Moderna, or whomever has shareholders and investors uh, to be quite honest uh, with their information. And what's coming out of those recent documents to the SEC is um, very, very different from the you know public messaging um, that we're getting from all of the top CDC or Pfizer CEO or whomever, you know, they can say one thing, but their actions and, and the documentation that they have to submit to certain people tells the true story. Um, so I think, Julie, you at one um, um, speech that you gave talked a lot about um, getting loud and, and using your voice to... Um, to push back on this line, because there is a line, it's palpable now to be totally um, transparent because, mm. um, you know, really damaging things are starting to happen and the consequences of those. So I, I am very 
aware of how I practice. I practice very differently than a lot of other family doctors or palliative care doctors. My approach is different and it's valuable. And I'm not saying that out of any kind of arrogance. I'm saying that from a place of humility, I I look around me, I can see what's happening and I choose to be different. So I choose to treat people differently. And in a time of crisis, I'm not going to, you know, dismiss my own values and, and morality and treat other people differently. So there's a lot of people out there that are not willing to do that. And there's an objective way that you can still maintain, um, you know, your kind of scientific rigor or your um, balanced view on, on issues and topics, but not negating and, and your own values and your own self. So I think that's really important. And self-reflection and introspection are huge skills to be learning to hone. Um, some people I'm not even sure have any awareness of what those are. Um, and I practice those actively every day. And that's, that's what helps me be able to think of things more deeply and more broadly. And if it gives a better full picture from my perspective, instead of that narrow myopic view. So I think people need to really step into their own voice, um, you know, know who you are. And if you don't know who you are, learn who you are and start moving forward from that line in your actions. So your behaviors, your treatment of other people, you know, setting boundaries and, and being loud about that you and, and your perspective are valuable. Mine are valuable in my community and they're necessary and essential. And, and it's being Not denied. Used. What it's you, used. Not, yeah. Mm, what you mentioned there, um, you know, doing the things that are consistent with who you are and what your values and your beliefs are. The technical ethical term for that is integrity, right? You're acting consistently with your deeply held beliefs and values. And um, whatever those beliefs and values are, we can, I mean, you can argue that, you know, a a serial killer has integrity to the degree that he or she acts consistently with the principles, right? So it's a kind of wholeness or the the, the way the parts work together in a system. And um, one thing we know from, uh, from ethical research is that when people lack that, they suffer in ways that you, that you might not expect, right? That you have a, a crisis of identity, that you feel a, a kind of a, you know, a tension between various parts of yourself and, and, and people who are in that state can experience depression and isolation and loneliness and kind of self-loathing or, or a combination of those things. And so it's not, it's not this idea that, that COVID should make us suspend yeah, who, who we were going into it without consequence is, I think, a, a wrong-headed, poorly researched idea, right? And, yeah. and I think, you know, I think woke, woke culture has really hurt us this way because there's been an attack on freedom of speech going on in uh, North America for decades, right? Which you know all too well, having been on a university campus. Mm-hmm. And so this is part of the problem because, uh, you, you know, I... I remember George Jonas once said in a column that, uh, you know, back in the good old days, I think he was talking about the 50s, uh, if you had a difference of opinion in Canada, you know, and it was, you know, dramatically different, you know, your neighbor would say to you, well, it's a free country, (laughs) you know, right? Right? You you can think what you want. But I, I, and I remember people saying that when I was a kid, Mm. uh, you know, and, uh, but nobody says that anymore. Um, and, and so we actually have a habit in some quarters of shutting down speech. And unfortunately, this COVID narrative has just kind of merged with that. And I think people don't respect uh, the autonomy of the individual when it comes to the truth of the matter and what the individual may perceive as the truth of the matter. Um, and, and so this, this is a really big problem overall. Which means they don't respect themselves, which is not surprising that we have, I think, kind of an individual and, 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 and group identity crisis in our country. You know, it's, mm-hmm. I am so grateful to both of you for offering your thoughts. I want to give each of you an opportunity to, to contribute a last thought and maybe just to think a little bit about where we're going and where the seeds of hope are for the future, whether by that we mean, you know, in the coming months or if this is going to require decades long approach. Russell, do you want to go first? Oh, sure. 
Um, it's a, a very uh, difficult thing to to sort of see uh, through the forests when we're sort of, I think, still right at the beginning of the pathway. Um, I think ultimately we're going to be dealing with this for decades, most certainly the uh, collateral damage uh, for decades, even maybe longer. Uh, this is a profound moment in human history that I don't think people really even recognize. Um, and and it's, it's hard to say exactly where it's headed. I'm hopeful that, um, you know, the humanistic side of um, the the abuses and the harms that we're bringing forward into the court systems won't be denied or dismissed. Mm -hmm. um, and that maybe that's a place moving forward um, because in any crisis, those should never be dismissed and, and not thought of. Um, if you have a, a whole, you know, concept of something with a bunch of moving parts within it, when those moving parts start to break down, the entire system starts to break down. The whole thing will break down eventually. Mm -hmm. So I think there's, you know, we're approaching this kind of time almost where there's there's got to be some kind of pause and reflection from amongst a lot of people. Mm -hmm. um, and that's certainly where I'm trying to contribute. Um, and I, I think a lot of, and, and Michael as well, um, I think some of it may happen with some of our physician court cases um, and some hopefully precedents that will be set. Um, but there's a lot of, there's so much quality character building happening amongst a lot of people. There's communities being uh, built and uh, shaped and, and there's a lot of positives um, that are really kind of emerging out of all of this. And that's where I think hope lies. Hope lies in how we uh, treat one another um, and, and human dignity is, is top priority in that. Um, and we can always find ways to shift from there. Um, so I'm, I'm pretty hopeful. And we may need to these communities that are being built are, are quite are composed of people who are quite open and respectful. And it'll be interesting to see how they'll act as a kind of safe shelter for people who were maybe you know, more allegiant to the narrative and then finding some kind of dissonance and, and needing to find new communities. So that'll be quite interesting moving forward. Michael, yeah. last thoughts? Uh, well, I totally agree with uh, Crystal. We're at a turning point here. And it, if we proceed along this path that we're on and it, it remains fundamentally unquestioned and dealt with, we're gonna be looking at an entirely new society, which is not neither liberal nor democratic um, in, in the classical sense. So um, I, I'm very optimistic right now that we can make progress uh, within the court systems, uh, bringing the colleges uh, within the law. Uh, we already have a few decisions on the books. They're somewhat accidental decisions and unexpected decisions that indicate that some judges are willing to take a look at this problem of, uh, of overreach of authority and, and deal with it. So I'm optimistic that we are, also we are presenting arguments to the court, at least I will be, that the court has never faced no material before vis-a-vis -vis the college. Uh, so the, the college has just not been taken on because generally lawyer, I mean, doctors are represented by the CMPA, lawyers with the Canadian Medical Protective Association. Right. And they have a policy of not challenging the authority of the college, but negotiating and working within the framework given to them by the college. Okay, so, so now doctors are stepping outside of the CMPA and, and seeking independent advice, and they're finding out that they're actually in a different world than they thought they were in uh, all these years. So, so we're going to bring new arguments to the court that I hope will make a difference. But generally, um, you know, coming out of this, we, I mean, so many institutions have been corrupted, the universities, uh, the journals, the... Uh, you know, public health. I mean, look at the WHO. It gets over a billion dollars a year from Bill Gates and the, the Gabby Alliance, which was founded and still funded by Gates. I mean, uh, we need a second enlightenment uh, where we reassess how our fundamental institutions work and peel away the layers and see what's really going on under, underneath. And it's there for you to see if you want to look. Some of it's hidden in plain sight. Um, but I, I don't think in Canada we can get away was saying that we are a democratic country unless we have new rules in place that guarantee transparency and accountability in all our governing institutions. I tried to figure out how Health Canada works uh, a couple of months ago, and I'm trained to do that kind of thing. I can't think, 
<laughs> I can't figure it out. Okay. And th this is a real problem. How is the citizen supposed to figure out how this major agency, which is responsible for our fate in medicine, and well, medical it's very care. important in, in your context when judges are just deferring to the edicts of Health Canada as though there is no separation of the judicial system from um, from our from our ministries. I mean, that is very it's a very scary place to be. Yeah. So so it, my agenda is a reform agenda going forward after we win some of these cases and hopefully get some public recognition that we have not been told the truth about uh, this virus and how to deal with it. Well, thank you so much to, to you both, Michael. It's funny hearing you talk about uh, needing an enlightenment. I, I think I've said exactly that thing before. And the thing that would really characterize the enlightenment before it was, before was that it was a recognition of the importance of reason in the individual. And that's really what yes. we've lost, but it's something that we've had all along. I mean, this doesn't need to be this kind of reform. It's not, there's nothing new under the sun in some sense. We just need to realize the value of this thing that we've all had all along that's within all of us. And I think that speaks to your point, Crystal, that we need to, you know, get back in touch with who we are and what we really believe in. And um, not holding on to that isn't without consequence, right? I think people have this idea that, oh, well, it's not that important. Who, you know, if I, if I don't stand up for what I believe in, I can hide in the safety of the shadows. But there's a consequence to that too, not just for the individual, but for, for, the, for the group. And it's very, I, I just really appreciate the, um, you know, how candid you've both been in your discussion today, because it's, um, it's not sensational in my mind. It's important to balance out the information that um, if, if you just turn on the news, you don't get anything like this. And it's so important for people to hear both sides of a very complex but singularly focused sort of story. And I'm tremendously grateful to you today. And I think many people will be as well. So thank you both. Thank you, Julie. Yeah, thanks, Julie, for this opportunity. Thanks for hanging out with me today. If you enjoyed watching this video, please consider making a tax deductible donation to the democracyfund.ca slash donate.